sure how I want to die exactly, but the way that I would dislike very much is on the cover of the, part of the most, I don't know, bought TV magazine in, the, in my country. So this is what happened to this one guy. It was very sad. This, but the idea of this debate is not whether or not the New York Times had the right to publish that image, but whether or not they should have or should not have. We're saying that they should not have. And we're also going to talk about the balance between his right and the, the, the effectiveness of the message that the New York Times was trying to send. We're also going to talk about how the New York Times was evil in doing this and how no media ever should do the, this kind of thing ever again. So first of all, we're going to talk about uh, proportionality in regard to privacy. Then we're going, to talk about, we're going to talk about blood and gore in the media. And then we're going to talk about the interference with the sensibility of the public. So, first off, proportionality and privacy. We think that there is a legitimate aim to try to educate the civil society and tell them that, okay, this man should have been helped or whatever. And there was a message to be sent there. But we also think that in the interference with this man's privacy in his most intimate moment, and the interference with the privacy of his family and friends who knew who the man was and saw him in his most final moment, we believe that that is too much. And we believe that the, that message, that, that educating message, could have been just as well been sent by writing an article about it and not posting the photo. We believe that there is no legitimate aim and no, no pressing social need that would push for this sort of in the infringement of privacy. We believe that privacy is an important thing in our society, and the right to, of a man to keep the, uh, the to keep his uh, the death somewhere at least to some decency in a private form is very important in our society. To, important to his image, important to the image of his family, important to the suffering of his family because we don't want his children or his wife when he, they're walking down the street to see images of the, uh, their loved one being killed and in the last moment of his life. We believe that that is cruel and we believe that that is unsound as a media uh, thing to do. We believe it is interference and exactly like in the case of Peck versus UK, um, we believe that this is an infringement of privacy. Uh, the, 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 this Peck versus UK guy, uh, there was one guy who tried to kill himself and the CCTV camera caught it online, caught it and the, another t TV media thing posted it online. And that was called an infringement according to European human rights. And we believe this is the exact same thing, especially because uh, the right to die in the, 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 the private, this moment is so private to an individual. Okay, second off, let's talk about blood and gore in the media. We believe that this is profiteering, shameless profiteering from the New York Times that they were doing. We were, they were posting this picture not to try to educate the public, not to try to tell, send a message, but to try to sell papers. Essentially profiteering for this, from this man's death, suffering and fear, which, I mean, which is what they were trying to transmit by sending that photo. No, thank you. Okay, we believe that if they were trying to educate, that they would have done so differently because what this photo sends out to them, what the message of this photo is, uh, is being sent out, is not the, what the psychologically people think about it when they see this, is, oh my God, this is so horrible. This is so horrible, I would not want to um, suffer this. I don't want to go to the metro station anymore. I am now scared. We believe that the right message to be sent here was, let's try to educate the society not to do this thing and that they should help and try to promote social, and, uh, social responsibility, which this photo is not doing. This photo is put there exclusively to create shock and to sell papers and at the expense of this man's privacy and this, in his family's well-being. And we believe that this is terribly unjustified and, we believe, and, and completely wrong from a, uh, from a newspaper that is theoretically, that should theoretically be balanced and pr produce objective point of, points of view. Yes? How is the text written by one, one journalist more objective than a photo that is provoking your personal reaction to the event? It is a lot more objective because, first of all, it doesn't the, the, the reaction to what happens there you know, of, um, when you see the photo is just shock. That's not trying to send them an educational message. It's not trying to explain anything. It doesn't say anything except doomed. That's the whole thing. It's the, uh, 
the photo is there exclusively to create shock, not to create an objective image of that thing. You can tell the story of this man without creating the shock, just putting the words there on the, about what happened and, the, and telling people about the event is way enough to create as enough shock, but also to send enough of the message and try to explain to people and try to educate the people about social responsibility. The photo is there exclusively to create shock, and we believe that that is worse than anything else that this paper could have done. And furthermore, let's talk about the interference with the sensibility of the public. We very much enjoyed the fact that when we were presented with this photo, we were warned that this would be shown to us, and all the people that are sensitive to this sort of thing should look away. That is because the organizers of this tournament agree that we, that me and everyone in this room has a right not to, sh not to see this sort of a shocking thing, not to be traumatized by it, and not, and not to be afraid of going to, to the metro station ever again. Now, we believe that by posting this photo, the New York Times ignored the sensibility of the population. By posting this on its front page, it assured that everyone in, this, everyone in that city, and possibly everyone, everyone in the world, saw this photo of this man dying. We believe that that is, in, that is completely insensitive, and that, one, that most probably caused a lot of grief for a lot of people. We remind the audience that the children could have seen this, his family could have seen this, his friends could have seen this, his co-workers could have seen this. A lot of people that had stuff to do with him, and a lot of sensitive people out there saw this image of this man dying. And we believe that that is fundamentally wrong and fundamentally inconsiderate of the... Uh, I believe I'm in my last minute. Okay, sure, fine, okay. Now, what we're talking about... What we talked about here today is extremely important because we need to draw this line between how shocking we want to let the paper be in order to, how much profiteering we want to be and the privacy of the individual and his right to die in, his, in the way that he wishes. We believe that there is this difference and, the, and there is a legitimate aim to try to educate the population but posting pictures of people dying is nowhere, is, does nothing towards that aim that's only to do with selling papers and the insensitive profiteering, and that is just morally wrong. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker, dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, first, what I would like to uh, establish here, uh, there was a very, I think, elusive way the way the Prime Minister presented uh, the case in the very beginning. Uh, by saying that uh, there are many kinds of death, but the one kind of death one wouldn't wish to anybody is uh, the death on the cover page of the newspaper. Ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, this man didn't die on the cover page of the newspaper. This man di died actually in, the, uh, in this uh, metro station, and we're talking about a completely different thing. This is not a kind of... Uh, picture from the network movie where the guy dies because he has a bad trading. This is absolutely different story. So let's, uh, it's not a death on the cover in this sense. Uh, and uh, the, in any way the coverage was, uh, did not promote the death itself. So th those are two different issues uh, whatsoever. Then uh, proportionality and privacy, the uh, Prime Minister brought the argument of privacy there. And the decency, the idea, the notion of the decency of that. Now, let us remember that there are classical examples of napalm photos from Vietnam, even just from Rwanda, that went out there. So what are you doing with this? Are you criticizing this coverage as well? Are you, are you saying that this is wrong? Moreover, do you really, are you going to go as far as to say that these images did not provoke any impact on the society? Napalm photos from Vietnam provoke deep impact and they had a huge impact on the way the social, uh, the social system has developed and the, on the reaction of the society to the war itself. Yes, please. There's a fundamental difference be between these two things. One of the, the Vietnam thing was supposed to create sensibility for the people that to stop other killings. Yeah, yeah, this was one man much. dying and it is sensible Thank you very much. I thank your question. No, the point here is absolutely the same and this is what you absolutely miss. Uh, when you say that the photos that uh, were not to be published. 
When you I actually brought this up, you said that there was uh, the only goal was profiting from this. No, it was not. Uh, you, uh, the goal was to create the discourse, and by the way, like the discourse was de facto created there, and this is a very important uh, thing uh, in the whole debate. And the sensibility of the public, the right not to be traumatized. So again, we publish photos from uh, Rwanda and we say that there, it's okay to see, or publish uh, uh, photos of people dying from hunger in Africa and we say that it's okay to look at these pictures, but it's not okay to look at uh, this particular picture. How this case is different from that, from all the rest of the cases when it comes to the sensibility of the public. But yes. if I wasn't there and I wasn't able to ever help, I rely on the vast majority of people that were there and are there. No, otherwise, why would we have democracy? And how does it uh, directly relate to what I'm talking about? I'm talking about not about the sensibility of the public. Now, let me pro let me move on to the uh, to the core of this debate. What we believe the major question is uh, in this debate is what is the role of the media here? So, what is the role of the media in the society? Our answer is first, media is out there to accurately depict the events and issues within the, in the society. And what follows from this is a very logical conclusion. The second basic of the role of the media is to allow to establish and provoke uh, the public discourse on these issues. What, 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 no, thank you. Uh, what happened there on this, uh, um, in this <coughs> central station, on that platform, what we see was a lack of empathy and the complete sense of alienation between people within the society and the idea that I would rather take a picture of a dying man than actually make any attempt to, uh, to help the person. Uh, yes, the guy is saying that uh, he felt that he was too far away, no thank you, but actually what would really count is at least the attempt to help the person rather than taking the picture. So, from that, we have established the role of the media, we have established the event. Does New York uh, Post has, uh, should New York Post cover it? 100%. There is a social phenomenon that has to be covered. Yeah, right. There is a complete alienation within the society that has to be discussed, and this discourse has to be provoked. Uh, so they are more than obliged to cover this. The second part of the poll question is why the poll do exactly, and uh, is, it is also a very important thing to discuss today, no thank you. Media should be covering any event in the most objective and effective way to provoke the to provoke the discourse uh, in the most broad sense. If your covering, if your coverage of the event is tilted, if your coverage of the event is uh, not effective, not uh, not, uh, not full enough, then the discourse would not be provoked to the full. That the quality of the public discourse would be uh, extreme, uh, would be hard. This photo, the photo itself, don't think you have a taking question. Probably. Uh, this photo stands as a symbol for what is going on within the society. The photo itself is not only just a depiction of the event, the photo itself is the material evidence for what has happened out there on the, on the platform in the metro. And this is why it is crucially important to present the, uh, this material evidence to the public and uh, so that the public can discuss what has actually has happened. But uh, moreover, providing the photo is also a most impartial in a way, way of uh, covering this event. Why? First, it provokes the immediate reaction of the person. So when you see the photo, you, this is your, these are your own emotions, this, uh, this is your own initial reaction to what you see out there. And second, and this is also very important, it eliminates the author's lens. It eliminates the lens of the journalist who is trying to tell you, look, this is bad, this is good. Look, there is no absolute answer to this question. We all know the thing that is written on the walls, this famous phrase, nobody has monopoly over truth. And this is precisely why you have to, uh, you have to provide just the poll. You don't have to cover the, the poll. You don't have to provide the frame of the author, uh, of the journalist who is depicting the event. So the fact that this event occurred shows that we have to talk about it, that we have to have a discourse, uh, we, have to, we have to have a serious talk within our society. Second, this debate has to be personal and honest, because this debate, this discourse, is, comes, to the, uh, comes close to the ex 
actual, to the essence of the morality that we hold in the, in the public. And New York Post has effectively provoked this debate, and the fact shows that this debate has, uh, has developed out of this. My colleague is going to talk more about the hypocrisy of the idea that the poem should not be published in the present state of the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So we heard from the first speaker of the opposition that actually there is no difference between publishing this photo on the front page of the New York uh, Post and publishing photos showing people engaged in warfare or people dying of hunger and so on and so forth. However, we believe that there are three important differences between this particular photo and such photos of unknowns in distant lands published in newspapers in a country other than their own. We think that, first of all, this photo was published in his own country. So that person uh, had this photo published on the front page of a newspaper which was widely circulated in his hometown. The, the importance of this lay is in the fact that people who knew him personally, so for example his friends, his relatives, had directly, I mean my first hand, had directly seen that photo and they knew exactly who he was. And, then, and secondly, the paper in which it was published was one of wide circulation, it was circulated in his country, in his own uh, town and thirdly, it was published on the front page, so it was not somewhere in the newspaper so that the only people buying the newspaper would see it, but it was actually on the front page so everybody passing a, a news agent by could potentially see that photo of that man. So we, this leads me to the second point uh, of my speech, in which I would like to emphasize the fact that this debate is really one about balance. We're not talking about whether or not the message should have been published at all. We're only talking about its form. That's the, that's the problem that the government has with the actual publication. It's not the message itself. I mean, we can accept that potentially it's good for such articles to be published because they can potentially enhance civic responsibility. It shows people that they should not be uh, mere bystanders, not intervening in the face of such potential catastrophes. However, we're talking about the form of the actual publication, and let's see whether it actually served this, this particular aim. And let's presume for one, uh, for one moment that it did uh, serve the same, that the publication did uh, have the effect of enhancing civil responsibility. But that's surely not the end of the matter, because we need to draw a balance, as the first speaker of the government has emphasized, between the interest of the public in the publication, which can be presumably traced to this uh, enhancement of civic responsibility, and the rights of that person to uh, privacy. We believe that privacy is a very important right, and that only weighty justifications can actually uh, uh, justify such in interferences. And clearly, the publication of a man's image in the moment right before his death constitutes such an interference and therefore calls for uh, powerful justification. And look, let's look at whether the opposition has managed to actually bring such a justification to the table. We believe that clearly they have not. Because, because of the fact that that person was shown in the moment right before his death, we think that his right to privacy was actually connected with engaged in, uh, when that public publication was made, especially since it was made on the front page. His family, his relatives, everybody could have access to it. And this circumstances, we don't think it was justified. We think there could have been, uh, the publication did not serve, in the words of the first speaker, any pressing social need, because there were alternative ways of actually transmitting the same message could, which would not have had the same profound impact on his right to privacy. But before talking about this, I'd like to take your point. Sir, how would you advocate against the bystander effect, since you're advocating this is not the way? Uh, well, I'm not advocating against this message. I agree that the message can have an importance, but I, I advocate against the fact that the pu publication was accompanied by a photo of this man on the front page of the newspaper. We believe that a well-written article on that topic without actually publishing the photo on the front page with the word doomed written on, uh, over it could have had the potential same effect minus the negative uh, effects of this uh, uh, publication which uh, translated not only into detriments for his own privacy but secondly for the public as a whole because the, the publication constituted an interference with their sensibility and we don't believe that education through shock is really the way to go. We don't believe that appealing to the sensitivity of people by showing them a picture of a man before his death has any impact on enhancing their civil responsibility because the message that that photo sends is that look guys there's a shocking picture of a man about to die. This is his very last moment. But we don't see why that uh, photo could actually transmit a message that, hey, you should have helped him. We think that a well-reasoned article could, on that topic could have started a debate on, uh, without uh, having this, uh, this uh, without also bringing these detriments in terms of both his pri right to privacy and the rights of the uh, public. We think that the, the photo itself could, could 
could not communicate this message effectively and only appeal to their subjective understanding of people rather than providing a reason, actual uh, the, the public discourse. So again, we're not against the, the public discourse itself, we're only against its form, and we believe that there could have been uh, ways of transmitting the same message and emphasizing the same characteristics, but in a different manner. We don't see why the publication on the front page was actually necessary. And now, uh, talking about the uh, the fact that the opposition has actually mentioned that they uh, they haven't actually talked about the formal publication. I mean, we agree. The first speaker has continued to emphasize through, throughout his speech that actually what the message, the public discourse message that this uh, the publication had was very very important, and that it had started an actual debate. However, we didn't hear anything from the first speaker proving that such an actual debate had actually taken place after the publication, and we don't see why uh, people would not in general be capable of understanding and perceiving the same uh, message by not uh, having to, to see this photo. Why, why was this publication necessary? I could appreciate that the first speaker could explain at this point. Yeah, there, are many, there are many books going out every year about how we should help each other and how we should be good. And there are many classical books on that uh, issue. But why does it they don't work? Well, well, we don't see why they don't work. We don't see why people need to be shown again on the front page of a newspaper. We think that showing it on the front page, as opposed to somewhere within the newspaper, has interfered with the autonomy, with the autonomy of the public, with the autonomous right that every human being enjoys, not to be shocked, not to be subjected to shock. And we think that by showing it publicly, so for example, every every person who passed a news agent by would see that photo, and we. See, we think that there can potentially be sensitive, particularly sensitive members of the public, such as white, uh, young children or people who might be psychologically weaker than the average person, who might be affected by, by that because they in no way consent to actually seeing that photo. They just look at it and they, they cannot, it, it just happened by accident. They, they uh, happen to see a photo of a man right behind their, before his death. It's not an autonomous choice that they're, they're making and we believe that the New York Post by actually publishing it on its front page, again, not somewhere in the newspaper, has interfered with the, with the right of the public to make autonomous life choices for themselves. So for all these reasons, for the fact that it constitutes a great interference with the man's privacy, for the fact that it offends the sensitivity of the public, and for the fact that it also interferes with the public's uh, freedom to choose what, uh, uh, not to be shot uh, whenever they're in public, we believe that you should stand for this moment. Thank you for the floor, Mr. Speaker. A very powerful, outlier, a little bit crazy man once said that the death of one is a tragedy and the death of many is a statistics. And this is what the government is standing by today, saying that the death of many in uh, Vietnam and Rwanda is just a statistic which is justifiable to be put on the front page. Oh, but wait a Shame. second, the death of one is just uh, the tragedy and the death of the many is not. So basically, we believe on the opposition side that there is fundamentally no difference in the function that the newspaper is serving when publishing war pictures and publishing this picture. Because as one of the government members pointed out in his POI, it's about sending a message. It's about sending an educational message, which in both cases, the media does by publishing the picture, by shocking the audience. Exactly this is the tool that is necessary to achieve this, to send this message. And we cannot do it otherwise. Now, moving on to some points of rebuttal. I really like the point about, yeah, the message is sent, but this is not the point. We need to preserve the autonomy of the people, because this is what matters. The individual sensitivity of the people is what matters. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is why this death happens at the end of the day. Because we live in an individualistic society in which the autonomy of the one is prioritized over the greater good of the society. And because we are so taken over by our individual uh, egoistic, selfish priorities, we didn't help this person. And now, because the government is so taken by their egoistic, selfish worries of sensitivity, they don't want to see this picture published, and they say the New York Times should not have yes, something. Did you become a better person after seeing that picture? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Because I thought to myself, would I have helped this person if I was there? And then after deep thought, I realized that probably I wouldn't have, and now I'm trying to change myself. So I did. Now, further on, we heard that, yeah, the message was sent, but they should have done it in another way. They should have done it in a way that is less shocking, that it doesn't harm the people. So moving aside the selfishness of this claim, we think that the government actually failed to propose what other ways. They said that, yeah, they could have done it in an article. But as uh, Igor pointed out, as I pointed out in my POI, actually the picture is the most objective.
objective way, it is the one that brings out the most individualistic reaction, the most personal reaction, the most right. honest reaction, to which that you cannot hide away. And we don't want people to look away, and we want people to look at the picture, to actually visualize <coughs> and to think about it. Uh, okay, could we or could we not have had this debate without seeing the photo? No, we have. could not have had this debate, because things like that have happened in the past, and there was no picture published. It's not the first time somebody dies in the matrix, it's the first time somebody publishes what? a picture. But we're having this debate now about the societal solidarity, about the lack of empathy in society, because the picture was published, and this is what the role of the media is, this is what the role that the New York Times fulfilled, and this is how media should operate, sending a message to the public. Sending the message that is relevant to the status quo, which is relevant to what is happening <coughs> in society. What is happening in the society is that we live in a super individualistic society where our own sensitivity, where our own fears and autonomy are more important than helping other people, than living in a solidar solidarity. In solidarity, yes. Now, we think that uh, there are no other ways that would be as efficient as the ones that now I'm not going to take any more questions. And the government admits the message was sent. They didn't propose in what other way the message could have been sent. So we assume that ours is the best, and we actually prove it. Now, after we have established that, I would like to talk about how the government is saying that the New York Times should not have published the photo for, because of its immense hypocrisy. Because actually, we should be ashamed of the society, not of the newspaper. It would live in a society where nobody actually turned around and took five seconds, or maybe ten seconds, to walk to this person and try to help him in the 60 to 90 seconds that were available to them. Instead, they, turned, they took 30 seconds to take out their phone, switch on their camera, focus, <coughs> and take the picture. And we think that this is the real problem. The real problem is not the New York Times publishing the photo. We think that the sin committed by the bystanders in this metro station is times and times, times greater than what we can speculate with the sin. I'm not going to take any more questions. I appreciate that is a thousand times greater than the sin that could have potentially been committed by the New York Times according to the government by sacrificing the autonomy of the people. And we think that the government is using the New York Times as a scapegoat because we need somebody to blame, but as a government they cannot blame the people if they want to be re-elected or something, so they prefer to blame the New York Times because, oh well, we are prepared to criticize the media but we are not prepared to criticize ourselves. And we think that it is, uh, if those people didn't respect the man in his life, they didn't respect him enough to help him, we cannot be as hypocritical and go as far as saying that, oh, we should respect him in his death. No, we actually threw away respect the moment we didn't save him, the moment all the 20 or 30 bystanders didn't save him in the one to two minutes that they had available. I'm not going to take any more questions, I appreciate that. Thank you. Now, basically, we think that um, it is not, it is, first of all, it is fine for the New York Times to make money of this, but the same way it is fine for any newspaper to make money out of any other news. This is the way the media works. They need to make money to publish the next news. They need to make money to publish, publish uh, their, their, their uh, next uh, edition. Come on. Right. <laughs> Come on, guys. So seriously, we think that saying that the New York Times was going, did make money out of this is not an argument enough to say that it actually shouldn't have. The, medias, the media outlets do make money, uh, and they do make money out of the deaths of the thousands in Syria, they do make money out of the protests in Turkey, and these are all events with negative connotations for the people experiencing them. But we're allowing that because they are sending the message, because as a society we want to be informed of what is going on. Not only of the pinky pictures of roses and butterflies, but we also have to face the ugly truth. We have to face the ugly truth of the events in Syria, we have to face the ugly truth of the events on the, in Gaza, or well, now we have to face the ugly truth in the events in our own metro stations. So we think that making money is not doesn't mean that we should only make money out of positive things. We should be making money to move our media forward. But this can come at the price of making money on negative experiences. So now, to sum up what has been going on, on the government side, they agree that the message has been sent. The message that we are sending on the opposition side is that there is lack of empathy in society, there is lack of solidarity in society, and this is wrong. And the media should portray this, should show what is going on in order to encourage public discord, which happened, and it happened in newspapers, and it happened in other media outlets, and I don't have them with me to show you, but they did. And we believe that actually the photo is the best way to do that, because it is the most <coughs> personal way to do it, because it is the most honest way to do it, and we believe that the government is being horribly hypocritical by saying that the sin of the New York Times is not forgivable, whereas the sin of the tens of bystanders there is actually okay. We believe that sending the message is more important than autonomy, than the sensitivity and the privacy of the people for which the government cares so much. This is a very...
very sad today. It's a debate about bystander people. It's about how we change the narrative of society. I know the polls are often agree with this, right? But it's very, very sad about in which people lie because they everything because they can claim that they have been changed after seeing the picture of terror, which contains, and we have to all establish the common ground before we continue for the run. It contains one man, it contains a railway, it contains one train. There's no context. There's no other people, there's no audience, there's nothing which would put the situation in context with which we can have, uh, which we can evaluate whether or not somebody was empathic enough. It brings only terror in the narrative of doom, not people doom, doom. And it brings only suffering and pain to those who have seen it. Now we believe that sensationalism of that is very bad. We believe it doesn't provoke, provoke it doesn't provoke any good in society because we've tried it before. And we're going to come to that. Just two points of rebuttal that I want to make before we go. This is not either the debate about privacy, right? Because we had CCTV probably even before that, before that. So we're not going to go with that. It's not impartial. It's not impartial narrative. Because it had we what we know about that picture is that it contains two human beings, one behind the camera, one in front of the camera. Everything else we have no idea what that. Right? Until we read the story. So it's not really impartial, right? Because when you read the story, it plays in context that we judge the photographer for not helping the one, the one man. Maybe, but probably not. Because then we rationalize and then we rely on the vast majority of people who were there shame you, who were there, uh, who were there and who decided not to help. If we did not rely on the vast majority of rationale of the people, we wouldn't have democracy in the first place. Right? That was the first point. The second point of the bubble is that, you know, this is the money that uh, news, news corporations make money out of news. Fine, then it begs the question why no other news agency published this picture, right? That's the question that we need to have before starting talking about bystander. Now, bystander, how do we engage in society? How do we, what do we sell? How do we move people to be more empathic, to be better to other people? What do we do? We firstly celebrate when somebody does something good, right? That's why you feel good after seeing the Hollywood soap movie, right? Because it moves you to do something good. It brings all of you know those shallow but very nice and first good uh, uh, good emotions that, that that it provokes. Second thing that we do is that we judge people. That's why it was different than the than the uh, Vietnam pictures or pictures of Rwanda when it wasn't necessary, when it's not rational. When it's not something that we would all agree that we would do in a certain situation, we judge people, then we, then we start the movement in our society. Then we start the engagement in our society. We also lie about ourselves because we also claim that we are better than we are, right? But when we rationalize the things, we need to be able to say, no, this picture, this book, this movie did not move me, did not change me as a person. Because if they claim that all the books and all the movies do not work on them, when they are talking about the nice things and how we should be nice in society, they cannot possibly claim that, that's, that this picture changed them to better. Right? That's what we need to have and need to know before going on. Right. Let's go further on. We had a guy who got Pulitzer, uh, who got Pulitzer Prize for recording and taking a picture of a child dying in Africa. Right? What happened with that guy? He firstly could not live with the idea that the humanity uh, appreciated his effort, not helping the kid, but the effort of taking a picture that much. And secondly, he couldn't believe because he did it not because of that kid, because many other kids died the same way in Africa. He wanted to start the people moving and thinking about that. What happened? They judged him for not, be, for not helping the kid. You know what happened in the end? The guy killed himself three weeks after he got full surprise. Did we have any massive growth on any massive engagement of NGOs or any, you know, individuals in Africa to help Africa kids? No, it didn't happen. That's why my this picture is not working and does not need to be. Now let's talk about democracy and Samaritan and how does that work, right? <coughs> we in the, necessarily, in democracy, we believe in vast majority of people that are rational people, right? That's why we believe in their decisions. That's why we say when we have informed choice that you're going to make the rational one, even if you're going to rationalize backwards, right? This picture, when we put this in context, right, creates just one narrative. It creates the narrative of terror. 
It creates the narrative of terror, and especially with the headline which says duty. It, it creates the feeling that I never want to be in a situation which, from which I can't expate, ex escape, right? It creates the narrative which says only that that guy was really, I'm part of my French, but screwed. It doesn't say anything about society or emotions, but my eyes are uh, Milan, how does denial help us get to a better society? It doesn't, Maya, but th doing good things and publishing that does. If you want to change the narrative, the media educates people, then let the media publish about good things and the actions of NGOs and other people or individuals that do good things in society, that shows that you're able to do something in society, that shows them that they are able to change something in society. That's why it's very shameful that EUDC in Belgrade never got to the front page of newspaper, right? But that's the point. As long as we buy because of newspapers and rely on the sensationalism of terror and of the bad things, right? We're never going to move or change anything that we don't like about current society, right? This is because this was not the video. There was no context. There was no picture. There was no other picture of the audience of people looking at that guy or not doing anything. It didn't put things in context. That's why it didn't have the impact of society that you would like to have, right? The shock effect that it was used is even worse. That's why it is very harmful. That's the worst off on the publishing this page. Because once it's placed in doomed, and once people see the shock of the guy in inevitable death situation, and see doomed, there is the reluctancy to help any time that that happens again. Because they were thought, and the shock that they've experienced after that, they were thought that that's the doom situation from which one cannot escape. There is no help for that guy, therefore there is no engagement or even will to try to help before that. Because we thought the society that that situation is inevitable. That's why we beg you to go. Milan said there is no context, there is no other people on the platform, you don't see anything else. But what is so painfully obvious to me, obviously escapes him. You are the photographer. You are the photographer and this is precisely what makes this photo so important for this debate and so important for educating against the bystander effect. I'm very happy that the opposition or the government in this case, that they are taking on my POI that asks how do we educate against the bystander effect precisely because this is what this debate is about. Uh, most of my rebuttal is going to be interwoven, but I would like to first reflect on the opening element. Now, they're telling me basically that this is just too shocking. This is too shocking, it's morally outrageous, and this is why we shouldn't uh, have published this photo because what is at stake is the autonomy and sensibility of people. However, Precisely, we're having this debate because this particular incident was shocking. And we believe that what is much more morally outrageous is denial. To deny the idea that these kind of instances, these kind of emotions exist in people. Now, the bystander effect in a nutshell means that the more people there are witnessing your hardship, somebody attacking you, something happening to you, the lesser the likelihood that actually you're going to receive assistance. And this is exactly what this particular incident has uh, illustrated. As the opposition has already told you, the reason why the image is very important is because it speaks a thousand words. And uh, the image itself puts you in the position of the photographer. And this is exactly why you yourself are then going through the actual monologue or debate with yourself, internally asking yourself what you would have done yourself. Because you're the one taking the photo. Now, uh, I work for the Anna Frank House, and Anna Frank stands as a symbol of the Holocaust in which six million people perished just because they were Jewish. And we are at the same time always aware in Holocaust education when we do this process that one Anna Frank touches more people than six million others. And the reason why she touches so many people is because she puts a face and a story and a personality to the actual magnitude of loss that was suffered during World War II. 
what, so that what you're trying to do now is shift the debate from the actual harm that you've done to all those, to that man's privacy, to that man's family, and the harm that could have been avoided because we could have had this debate in this room without having seen the photo on the screen today. If we would have just been told about the photo, we could have still held this debate. But sir, the reason why we actually have bystander effect in our society is because we try so hard to remove ourselves and to detach ourselves from all of these things. We try to put barriers uh, against uh, us being shocked because we are so afraid. And uh, the extension of the closing opposition is going to be basically about psychology, human psychology. Why do we do this and why we actually need to be shocked out of this loud complicity and complacence that our current life exists in. Now, first of all, role of the media. The role of the media is to actually reflect on the society, but just like art, the role of the media is to shock sometime, to reflect, but most importantly, to help us transform the society we live in. It's kind of like a mirror on the society, and it would be actually immoral and unethical to lie. It would be immoral and unethical to not tell the full story. On the side of the opposition, we are very happy that most other newspapers did choose to just talk and write. However, we believe that the New York Post, in the act of publishing the photo, took that extra step that was very, very necessary. Because guess why? Not everybody reacts and learns the same way. As has been pointed out to you, we live currently in a very alienated society where individual rights, just like the government case, putting sensibility and autonomy above everything else, matter. And we believe that precisely in an urban jungle that is New York City, we need to go that extra step to wake people up. To wake them up from the dangers of the individualism and from the dangers of the idea that somebody else should step up and do something because I don't have to bother. This does not really concern me personally. The reason why this photo is important is because it makes every single one of us realize that we are all in this together. We are all complicit to what happens in our society. Point. Even if you're living in a building and you hear your neighbor beating up his wife, if you don't say something, you are an accomplice. And this is the whole idea. We have to stop being accomplices. Now, no. How we view ourselves, Milan has pointed out something I agree with wholeheartedly, people have a tendency to see themselves as much better than they really are. This is the whole beauty of denial. We actually think we're all really nice people and this is why in times of hardship, in times of conflict, you have a very small minority, sadistic minority, that are actual perpetrators, you have a group of victims, you have an even more minuscule minority, which are the heroes, people who put their own lives at risk to save others, but the megalomaniac majority, we're talking 85% of population, is standing on the sides, thinking, this is not happening to me, this doesn't concern me, perhaps if I look the other way, it is going to go away. And this is the reason why, in psychology, we need these kind of images to shock us from our sleep, because empathy and compassion are muscles. And if we do not exercise them, they atrophy. They grow, and this is the problem with the current media and the sensitivity and autonomy and privacy protection that they just try to basically actively engage in silence. Finally, communication. How do we educate against the bystander effect? Blaming and shaming in bystander effect instances is counterproductive. If I read an article saying, what kind of horrible humans we are, how dare we let this happen, we are animals, I am not going to hear the message. Because the message, the way it's being conveyed to me, is making me feel bad about myself. If I see the photo, and again, image speaks a thousand words, the image is going to make the blood in my veins go chill, simply because I'm the photographer in this particular instance. And it will make me think twice what kind of repercussions this has on both myself, what if I was that person in those tracks, or what if I was there standing on the side. The reason why I'm standing here is because I'm asking everybody to break out of this conspiracy of silence. The primary values we're trying to defend here are not the autonomy of the individual and sensibility of the individual. The primary value is compassion. Okay, uh, this is a hard debate. We said debate, and we, as a side of the government, which I like to 
uh, point out. Firstly, I'd like to have a couple of points of rebuttal on the opposition to show how actually this wasn't the sent message properly. This wasn't anything but the denial that you're doing something else. If my own prevention denial is that. But it's side of the opposition is obviously denying the realistic situation that happened. And the situation was that that picture originally was just pointing the guy, the photographer, and the train. And nobody was thinking about the photographer. They were thinking about the guy and discuss discussing the fact that the guy was standing in the subway and was hit by the train my minute and afterwards. I mean, not half afterwards. After the story was pointed out afterwards, then the discourse happened, and then the story happened. And the side of the opposition firmly believes that the photo wasn't able to publish, and it wasn't really necessary to publish the photo if the story that happened afterwards wasn't connected with the photo, but with the story that happened, and the story was about the people, <coughs> not about the photo. So basically, for a person point to the rebuttal. Uh, my first claim that the story about the photographer is making the story really relevant. Unfortunately, nobody was thinking about the photographer when they saw the picture, as I already mentioned. The photographer obviously had a couple of reasons why he didn't help. The photographer was only one person in the whole story. As we find out uh, that a couple of people, like a lot of people, were actually standing in the station, the discussion happened. The discussion wasn't about the photographer. He was only mentioned a couple of times with the question, why didn't you help? And once he had said why he didn't help, the whole burden actually fell on those people. The photo itself didn't, wasn't talking about those people, wasn't mentioning those people, and itself it didn't create the discussion. It didn't create discussions, it didn't create a send out message that those people there were basically didn't have. So the photo with the whole outbound that happened afterwards did have no relation whatsoever except actually actually pointing the shocking effect, pointing the terror that happened at the same moment, and pointing out the poor guy actually was killed under the train and all of us wouldn't actually enjoy being killed on the train. And that was the point of the photo. Once it was published, it was only discussed how horrible it is to die under the train and not what happened afterwards. That was the point of the photo. Secondly, the shock, the terror, the transfer, to actually mirror the society based upon the media. Yes, we do agree that at some point it would be wrong to lie, as my already mentioned. And we do believe that the story that was beyond here, beyond this, the story about actually that guy was doomed, was actually a worse lie that you, you can actually have to actually publish that lie from the media to society. Because that guy wasn't doomed. That guy might have survived if those people were able to help. And the story that was published with the New York Times, New York Post, was actually that the guy was doomed. Pumped. Nothing after happened afterwards. They weren't explaining how actually the terror happened because those people didn't help. They were just trying to explain how a poor guy died and he was doomed. Nobody was talking about the effort. Nobody was talking about the shock. And the only thing that happened after New York Post actually published the photo is our terror and our shock and our thinking and our opinions of the fact that we didn't want to die that way. So basically, those the role of the media weren't actually satisfied and weren't actually affected. And secondly, they were lying about what actually happened in that moment because the whole story wasn't about the guy who died. The whole story about the people who didn't help. And that happened after the photo, not because of the photo, and not included in the photo. Third point was actually that we have to wake these people up and that we are reminded that we are all in this together. This photo, when it was published, was actually creating a discourse because uh, uh, we, we do actually, uh, we was not creating a discourse because we, we, we could, uh, if we can actually point out at some point, uh, that the first thing, that if we, if we see that this photo, if we find it as a personal thing, it, it becomes like more humane. We might empathize in some moment. And then when we see the photo, we are rationalizing. First, we see the shock. Then we see the point where he claims that he was doomed. And then thirdly, through that shock, we thought actually that there was no point to try afterwards. And then th this is where our feeling stops. And th this is where our thoughts and reactions that the, that's where you stop. And secondly, when we rationalize that photo that happened in that moment, we'd say, I'd help him, probably. But then we're thinking about those people after that, that were there that didn't help. And we're thinking that if the vast majority didn't help in that moment, that probably means that we wouldn't be helping for some reason, that we're not quite sure why we'd be helping, but we wouldn't be helping them in that moment, because we do believe the vast majority had a certain reason why they didn't help. And in that moment, we don't judge them. And in that moment, we're not actually all of this together. Right we're not creating actually the empathy of society. We're not waking those people up. We're just praying, creating and bigger and not increasing the common sense of those people that we're relying on these people who are, as Maya actually mentioned, like a uh, majority who are standing on the side, which is like the fourth point of your brother from Maya. She said like the majority of those people are standing this, uh, aside. And the problem is that uh, until we still be publishing those photos, which are actually showing that we're, pro uh, we're, we're humanizing, empathizing, but rationalizing and actually putting our si ourselves on the side of the vast majority which was there and didn't help and didn't actually do anything, we won't be judging them, we are becoming the vast majority of them, we are becoming the part of them, so not think about waking these people up, uh, just thinking about how we are only, uh, thinking about how actually we would have at some point, creating the transform reflection, nothing is happening that moment. Now, 
I'd like to talk about what's actually the story beyond. I was already mentioned we didn't have actually like anything showing, being shown in that photo which might actually create the, 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 the real feeling, the good feeling of those people who might have then thought that they, they were able to help. And the problem with that photo was something that happened uh, during the nineties with the guy who was taking the photo of the child dying in Africa and having this, this big black bird who was eating dead flesh or something, waiting for the child to die. And he was standing aside, taking the photo, looking at the bird, looking at the child until the moment the child died. When the child died, he just removed from that. And he published the photo because he wanted me to create a message, but also he gained a politics for that, and he did publish the photo. And that moment, the society actually awarded that, that sensationalistic approach. And since that moment, it, was, it started to be okay actually to put this uh, to photo, uh, to photo, to photo to public, because in that moment, people started selling newspapers even more. People started seeing those photos as like awarding something really big, being terror and shock, maybe because he had the reason to have uh, actually a good message, but at the end, it was nothing but, but uh, be, having a contest in which who will take like a more shocking and more terroristic photo, which won't have any actually out yeah, with the message at the end, but it will only be the reason that actually sent those newspapers even more, raising popularity and actually awarding the fact that sensationalistic approach is actually quite well. And in that moment, when we're talking about Rwanda and Vietnam and individual cases, Rwanda and Vietnam are actually situations in which we know it's, it's a war crimes going on. And those situations where we publish those photos aren't the ones which might help us to actually to engage with the story and be able to make us think that we might help at some moment because we know that we are not able to help. If we go there, we try to help those people, we're actually not allowed to go there and help those people, but we don't have any resources to help them. And it's a completely different situation of those individual cases which are happening in front of our eyes. And those individual cases are the ones that are being the part of the sensationalistic approaches of the newspapers who are actually taking those photos, publishing those photos, and lying about the story back background because the story, as I already mentioned, wasn't that he was doomed, but the story of us was about those people. So we do believe that Europe Post had, uh, had no obligation to publish this photo, and we do believe that the story that might have moved those people wasn't the photo, but the story of those people who were actually there on the station that held with that guy. We do believe that one is something which is quite complicated, which has no no uh, no uh, no connection with like, helping the people and creating a message. And we do believe that though on those individual cases which are creating terror, which are not actually talking about the real situation and which are actually making those people out without dignity and telling them they're doomed and not that people were the one because he was doing uh, the reason why he was doomed, we do believe we should propose this motion. Thank you. one of Milan's points that his teammate actually wrote, but I do think it's quite important, rationality, democracy. I think that this debate has illustrated one thing for certain so far, which is that in these kind of matters, there is no rationality. Because actually what comes to the surface is the emotions, and the emotions that make us feel really bad about ourselves, because ultimately we are forced to admit that Whatever it was existing in those photographers, those people standing at that platform, it potentially exists in all of us. Because we have no guarantees to say or to think that we would be the heroes. Maybe we would like to think that, but this particular instance, this particular story, precisely gives us the message that you should evaluate your own self, your own character, and ask yourself, would you have done the same thing? So rationality, unfortunately, doesn't hold in this debate. What is at stake? I'm right. going to summarize this debate by first talking about what's at stake, and then I'm going to talk about the actual outcome <coughs> of this publishing this particular photo. Wait. But before I continue, the opening government oh. seems very eager. How can seeing that photo make a mere bystander draw all these wonderful conclusions about civic responsibility and all that you're saying? Civic responsibility, sir, is not my frame. This is yours, and you seem to advocate a very high bar for what you want to accomplish. Civic responsibility is a utopian element, and I'm not advocating it actually coming out of this particular debate. On our side, I'm just trying to wake up a few individuals. So thank you for trying to elevate that bar and put it on me, but I'm giving it back to you because that was not my burden to prove. I'm asking for individuals to wake up. Now, first of all, what's at stake? From the government side, we've heard that what we need to be focused on and what we need to protect is the autonomy, privacy, sensibility of the individual, Whilst on the opposition side, we've been arguing that the alienation in society, sometimes cruelty, interpersonal cruelty, as well as the bystander effect, are infinitely more dangerous, and that they actually take precedence over the sensibility, protecting sensibility of the individual and their privacy and the autonomy. Now, how do we educate against the bystander effect? This was definitely an element of, of clash in this debate. 
on the government side, they were saying that we just need to write the story up, and this would have uh, been the education enough. I do agree with Milan's point that we should celebrate heroes, we should celebrate acts of bravery, because this does definitely give a positive message that you too can be a hero. Unfortunately, in this particular story, there was no heroes. So that leaves us with the dilemma of, do we face people with the ugliness that exists in humans, who are able to actually observe uh, such a horrible event and not do anything, or do we hide it? Do we deny it? Right. Now, we live in a society that actually exists and is currently based on a lot of dishonesty. And let's just look at marketing for a minute. Uh, if the actual food companies were to actually like market their products and the ingredients in the products honestly, it would come with a warning, please don't eat this, this is poison. However, we don't have that currently, because right now we're pandering to this view of ourselves that we are good, just like it was pointed out previously. And many people pander to the idea that we are good. Politicians pander to the idea that we are good. Marketing companies pander to the idea that we are good. What we are saying is that if the media start pandering to the idea that we are good, if the media start taking active part in this conspiracy of silence and in denial, we are gone. Because we have absolutely no honest, uh, outlets anymore left to actually show us what we look like in the mirror. And what was talked about on the side of the opposition is that media is supposed to stand as a mirror to society, they're supposed to reflect and help us reform and transform <coughs> our bad ways. Now, uh, moving on with the education against the bystander effect, I pointed out on several occasions that different people learn different ways. This is why currently the standardized education all over the world is failing infinitely because it's trying to make people learn the same way. Some of us respond to written material. Some of us respond to movies and connect to movies much more. Some of us respond to images. And we need to accept this and we need to recognize this because human life and human learning styles are so different and this is why for some people, and like I said earlier, precisely in an urban jungle that is New York, shock is sometimes necessary to lull people out of their complacency, complicity and sleep. My, on the contrary, some people through shock have learned that those situations are inevitable. Others may be the minority learn that maybe they need to help. Do you think the harm is bigger than the benefit or other way around? I am not saying that the image is going to wake everybody up. Please do not put the burden on me that's saying that every single individual that sees the photo is going to react the same way. The only thing I'm saying is that the New York Post did the brave thing, the courageous thing, the actually ethical thing by putting it out there because it generated much more debate, it generated much more controversy in the end. This is exactly what is necessary for some people to go that extra length the extra discussion to reflect. Because currently in society what we have is we actually do suffer from poverty of imagination. I've pointed out that empathy and compassion are muscles that need to be flexed, that need to be exercised. But because we have this poverty of imagination where the entire world around us is trying to lull us into this idea that we are so good and nice and kind to each other, this is precisely why it's sometimes hard to imagine a different world and to imagine ourselves reacting positively to extreme harsh conditions. Now, what is the outcome? If we were to side with the government and condemn New York Post in having published, published this photo, effectively we would be taking part in media censorship. We would be extinguishing one voice that was brave enough to actually provide the material that put every single spectator, every single viewer into the position of the photographer. We believe that censorship is not good, and like I said earlier, we believe that we need the additional ways of teaching against the bystander effect in order to drive the message home. However, the more important thing in this debate, the thing that this debate was really all about, is how do we view ourselves? On the government side, uh, it was argued that we have the right to privacy, we have the right to protect our sensibility. However, we believe that because we live in a society, that is incredibly interconnected, we need to forfeit some of these rights, such as the right to sensibility, which by the way is not a right, and the right to privacy, precisely because if I witness somebody else hurting somebody and I don't do anything, I'm an accomplice. I will be going to bed sleepless and waking up in the morning without the ability to look at myself in the mirror because I could have done something and didn't. 
and this is why this debate is incredibly important, and this is why we shouldn't window press, we should fight against denial and conspiracy of silence. Thank you.